Hello, my name is David Lankus, and I'm here to talk to you about radicals, rebellion, and saving our communities, which is a lot. But um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I really thank the uh, conference organizers for allowing me to speak to you in this form and format. I hope it's the beginning of a conversation, and I look forward to hearing from you disagreements, agreements, what have you. So today we're going to talk about the quote that led to the naming of this conference, where it came from, and it's really its new meaning in where we are. So when we do that, I have to show you something first. Hold on a second. It's a cute kitten. Now, I'm. this is obviously an attempt to kiss up to the audience and get them to love me, unless you're a dog person, in which case, wait for later. But this is going to be a necessary image because frankly, I'm gonna spend time talking about not a particularly good scene. I'm used to, in most of my career and most of my presentations and most of my keynotes, about really talking about positives and where we can go and how we can make a difference. And we'll get there. But to get there, I have to really show you the stakes that are at play here. I'm gonna talk about a situation that we're right in the middle of, and I'm gonna talk about its implications for libraries generally, internationally, but also medical and health science libraries um, where we're going. But keep this kitten in mind as we move ahead. And if things get a little dark, just remember there's a lovely cat waiting for you. So let's go right into it. To be a librarian is not to be neutral or passive or waiting for a question. It is to be a radical, positive change agent within your community. This is the quote that is attributed to me. It is my quote. I'm not going to run away from it. Uh, it is also one that helped shape the conference organizers. But I wanted to give you a little sense of where it came from and the history. Because as we'll see, this quote in its original context was all about being positive and changing the world and doing good things and really rah, rah, rah. Today, this quote is still, I think, important, if not more important, but it has a very different tenor to it. It's really, as we're going to show, show, talking about librarians being radicals and proactive and sometimes being represented as radicals in a negative light. But let's start with the background. Where did this quote come from? This quote comes from a presentation I was asked to do a keynote at the Florida Library Association. And as I was preparing and thinking about what I could say, Back in the days when Twitter was worth being on, I put out the following tweet and got the following response. So me, Florida librarians, what do you want to hear about in my keynote at FLA, Florida Library Association, Thursday? To which the response came from actually my doctoral advisor, good friend, and at the time did not live in Florida, who wrote, they want to hear that things are great. Everyone loves libraries and librarians just as they are but they need to hear that this isn't true, that the web and the Google have changed everything. Libraries and librarians must radically change or risk becoming a quaint anachronism. You know, because he's short on words. So also the date of this, actually it's many years ago. I want to say somewhere around 2013, actually probably earlier than that, probably somewhere in the early 2000s. And so I, I take this quote and sort of ran with it and gave a presentation where I talked about radical librarians because I love that little phrase about we must radically change becoming a quaint anachronism. And it, because I'm a word guy, took me some time to go in and find out what the word radical meant. And I know that sounds odd, but stick with me for a minute because it turns out that it's a great representation of how librarians should be. So in the English language, um, there are at least four different meanings to the word radical. So of or relating or pertaining and proceeding from the root. The radical of a plant is its root base. Um, when you talk about things like radical surgery, they're not crazy or cutting edge. It means they're going to remove the entirety of an organ, not just part of it or a piece of it. Um, the second is of or relating to origin or fundamental. Three is very different from the unusual or the traditional. And fourth is slang, because in the English language, particularly in the early 2000s, we used radical to mean like really cool. It's like something's radical. Um, 
And I like these because every one of these has, I think, a take on librarianship. That when librarianship is done well, in whatever setting, in a medical setting, in a hospital setting, in a public setting, in a school setting, it really represents all four of these contexts. It is about the basis of what we do, right? We're about service, we're about access, we're about learning, we're about creating environments and motivation. We're fundamentally about helping people make better decisions and find meaning in their lives. That's the root of what we do. It relates to its origin because while that may be seen in different ways today, through the internet, through databases, through social media, through generative AI, a lot of the values and principles which we use to implement these technologies go back, developed over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years of tradition. It can be very different in that radical librarianship should be at the root of a community and communities can be different should be, are different. And so our librarianship needs to look different from sort of this traditional cookie cutter model. When we believe that there was one prototypical library, that every library had a reference desk, it had collections, and these were the four services, and we all did standards, and we all do these things. To the point of today where librarians, not only in Norway and the US are doing things differently, but within Norway and from one institution to another, and that's, as it should be, that the common root, the fundamental thing that holds us together is librarian and librarianship, but how that gets expressed in a community can be radically different. Does it look like reference services to you? Does it look like a mobile health center to a library in the middle of rural Texas? Does it look like databases? Does it look like meeting areas? There's a health science library part of a university medical school here in Texas and San Antonio. During COVID, they eliminated all of their physical collections, except for one room of historical text. But the rest of the building, three stories, large square footage, had no materials in it whatsoever. When they reopened the facility, they found that students flocked to it. They built a video conferencing center where medical students, when they were looking for their internships, could now go and do Zoom interviews with 10 and 30 different institutions versus the old days when they would have to fly out and physically be someone you could only afford one or two. That library, that physical space looks very different than other libraries that are filled to the brim with collections. This one is filled to the brim with people in collaboration, but the fundamentals of why they're doing it to inform people, to help people find meaning and become smarter is true in that building as it is in another building as it is in another one because librarians hold that core together. So once again, we are different, but we have a strong core. And let's face it, we're radical, we're kind of cool. And we've seen that in the modern mythology where we've moved from shushing quiet librarians into tattoo wearing librarians in different areas and different views. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that image in a moment. So just to give you a sense of where this quote came from was that librarians are not neutral or passive. They are not waiting for questions or things to do, but to be a radical positive change agent. That is to make change based on fundamental beliefs and values that are hard won, that are contextual, and that are kind of cool. So what we're talking about is how do we go embed ourselves within communities and develop services that serve and look like those communities, where the commonality is not what one library looks like another, but the same function that librarians are doing in those communities. The librarians go in and they answer questions and build collections and build motivations and answers for what that specific community needs. We now are the common link versus some standard, this is how a library has to function. So a little bit more context before we jump into the content of this and you're wondering why you still need to think about kittens, but I'm afraid we're gonna get there very soon. So, Normally when I'm speaking, whether I'm speaking here in the U.S. Or, or the world, I try and have a very international perspective. I am a U.S. citizen. It's where I live. It's where I was raised. It influences my view. But I'm going to be really specifically about having a U.S. perspective here. I'm going to tell you about a case and a story and a situation that is occurring right now in the United States of America. And I'm going to be pretty unapologetic 
about how specific it is to th places like Texas and U.S. law. The reason is not because I don't care about international efforts or that I somehow think that we have a better or worse or whatever it is. It's because what's happening currently in the U.S., as I've talked to my colleagues internationally throughout the European Union, talking to them in, in Asia, talking to them in different areas, a lot of what's happening here in the U.S. seems like it's going to be happening in other places. And what's happening in the U.S., I just want to be brutally honest, is not good. And so by being prepared for it, by looking at our pain and our model, my hope is that in Norway, in the European Union, throughout the world, we can all work together across borders to make sure that what's happening here doesn't happen in other places and to make sure what could happen here doesn't. And what could happen here is a story about how communities and really small vocal communities can begin to influence the possibilities and range of information available to the people we serve. And I'm going to focus on things like public libraries and school libraries, but at the end, we'll talk specifically about how this is influencing the medical domain and the medical area. So I'm taking the US perspective, think of it as a case study. I'll do my best to draw links elsewhere, but just want to give you a sense of where we're going. All right, so what's going on in the US? Well, as I mentioned before, that radical librarianship and being radical and cool, that was, you know, a decade or at this point, 20 years ago. That quote came up from the idea of helping to rebrand librarians. So moving from quiet, shushing, this idea of the stereotype of library strong held in the US, and my understanding is strong held in other places around the world, and how do we shift and break out of it? And so what's interesting is over 20 years, uh, we've moved from the shushing quiet libraries to in many environments and many communities within the United States, we're now seen as radical groomers. We're now seen as people with a strong progressive liberal agenda that is seeking to corrupt the minds of youth, to groom and prepare them to live in a world where there are no standards and there is no morality. And I wish I was overstating that, but as you'll see in a moment, I'm not. We're going to talk about in a brief, um, we're going to talk about in a slide here, about how there has been an active movement to characterize librarians, specifically librarians, not libraries, not people of education, librarians as individuals, to characterize them as agents of, in essence, a false agenda, an agenda to groom and prepare our children to everything from children, childhood pornography, I'm not making that up, to a gay lifestyle, I'm not making that up, to preparing children to basically not have a moral center. That transition is not internally created, but comes from external forces we're going to talk about in a moment. And the clearest way that you can see this forced identity transition is through the idea of materials and book banning. In the United States, we talk about book banning, and we'll get it a little bit into the wording about what that means. And book banning is often represented as censorship, but there I want to be specific about my terminology. Book banning, as used by the American Library Association and in common parlance, means that some institution banned or prohibited access to that book doesn't have to be a government institution, doesn't have to be this type of library or that, but in essence, someone said, we want this book off the shelf. ALA counts that as a banned book. And we'll get to that in a moment because we'll see that different organizations have different uses of that phrasing. Censorship in the US and English context means that a government agency banned access to a given piece of material. So for example, a public library or a publicly funded academic library that removes materials, that is considered censorship. And it's covered under something in the United States called the First Amendment. Um, and so I wanna be really clear because that language is gonna matter in a moment. What we see in book banning, using that larger idea, is that it's going unfortunately way up. We have these, this data from the American Library Association, the number of attempts to ban and restrict materials, library materials in the US, is 458 2003, 464 2012, 
1,269 in the year 2022, and I will already tell you that 2023 will be much higher. We're seeing an increasing challenge of materials in libraries. They want to remove them. Now, that, this may sound counterintuitive, isn't a bad thing. The idea that communities are paying attention to what's in the library, that have an opinion, that want to have a conversation about what's in the library, that's a good thing. But what we need to talk about is how that's happening, and we need to talk about sort of underlying reasons for that. So the first thing that you need to see is that second graphic that talks about 90% of all of those challenged books were part of attempts to ban multiple titles. That sounds like a boring fact, who cares? But the reason that that matters is because what we're seeing with challenged materials, I wanna be really clear, in primary and secondary education, in higher education, in public libraries, and like I say, we're going to begin to see moving into other specialized areas. Those banning attempts are not individual members of a community standing up and saying, I have a question about that book. Increasingly, what we're looking at are national coordinated efforts, sometimes with a local constituency, but often not. And often there's a phrase in the U.S. we call astroturfing, which is fake grass. And the reason that term comes out is we talk about grassroots efforts, meaning those grown locally. And AstroTurf is an attempt to make it look homegrown, but in fact comes from a nationally coordinated efforts. And we've seen that in the United States. Um, for example, the Kraus list is a list of approximately 800 plus books. It's put together by a legislator in the state of Texas who sent it to every school district, school librarian and superintendent and said, we would like to know exactly if you have these books, where are these books? How can children get to these books? How much did you pay for these books? And what other books may cause, and I'm make, not making this up, children to feel uncomfortable about their race or their situation? Now that list wasn't an explicit call for censorship. There wasn't a follow-up that said, thou shalt remove the books. But what it created was a chilling effect. We saw that many school libraries, after receiving this letter and after attention of this letter, began to remove these books on their own because they were worried that it was going to lead to budget cuts and legislative action. This Krauss list, this 800 plus books, is a list of materials that predominantly, when you break it down, include things like books about LGBTQ, particularly books about trans, books about gay lifestyles, books with black protagonists. In essence, the list is not just a random list or a list of things that are seen as commonly known as pornographic or dangerous, but they really represent a, an ideology. An ideology that talks about that we've gone too far in the United States around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We need to get back to equality. We talk about too much about critical race theory and systematic injustice. We need to get back to talking about American values and American history. We need to get back to making people feel not guilty because of their race. When in fact, critical race theory and all of these different things are about making people feel included in these conversations. But my point of that is this list has been taken up and used in multiple places. One group that uses a version of it is called Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty is a parent-based group. They've now created chapters around the country and they show up at uh, town council meetings. They show up at education board meetings and they make a big stink about books that may be in the library. And I say maybe because oftentimes they don't check. They also tend not to have read the materials. So a lot of so that Krauss list of 800 plus books, Krauss never read them. Many of the people making challenges based on these books haven't actually read them. They're taking them from the list, identifying them in a collection, and asking them to be removed before they've been challenged, before they've been looked at, before they've been analyzed and discussed. So what that 90% happens is that what we're seeing is book banning in the United States is not only increasing in scale, it is increasing in sophistication, and it is moving from communities worried about materials in their local libraries, collections, schools, to national attempts around ideology. Ideologies that tend to be around conservatism, 
around anti-gay, anti-trans areas. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, the other thing that you need to know about the U.S. situation that become important when we talk about if this is coming to a country near you is that many of these bans are built under what I would consider legitimate concerns, or rather, they appear legitimate. For example, when we're talking about education, what's in a school library, what's in a classroom, parents are worried about what their um, children have access to. This makes sense. Parents are worried and have, a, have, have the obligation to raise their children. So the parents' rights concept is a strong argument, as a parent I should have. In fact, it's such a strong argument that all the policies built around the American Library Association, international library associations, all talk about, particularly in public library settings, that parents have a responsibility to, to monitor what their children are reading and guide them through that. It's a parent's responsibility to be with a child working through a public library. That's an agreement, but it's now turned into the idea that I need the library to be a safe place for my children, and I get to dictate what that's defined as for every other parent. And that's where the problem we run into, right? I, as a parent, should protect my children from this material. Good. I, as a parent, should protect all children from this material. That's when we run into problems. We also see this, for example, in education. In the United States, education is, is at state level, and it's seen as a very local thing. And the idea is that local communities should have a say in it. But the issue is that parents think that they should control curriculum without the expertise to do it, and also the recognition that schools and libraries aren't there for a specific set of parents at a specific set of time, but they're there by a community through a society's need for education. And the society coming together agrees what needs to be on that educational docket from mathematics to reading to civics. And individuals don't get to pick and choose what comes into that because we begin to define together what education for a society looks like. So that's an issue. Once again, legitimate concern, materials appropriateness, that children are getting access to things that are beyond their reading level, their preparation, their societal preparation, their belief systems. Once again, I think there's a lot of in common here, but we have to push beyond it when we begin to talk about for whom, for all. The minute we begin taking a set of concerns from a part of a community and applying it to the whole community is where we run into problems where these legitimate values turn into an illegitimate access and application. However, this is ultimately about imposing one view on many. Now, yay, Dave, I've seen this. I don't need kittens yet. This is not terrifying to me. What should be a bit terrifying is this. These are parents, these are actual images, this is Dearborn, Michigan, talking to a school board and talking specifically about removing materials and books from a library. You can see some of the signs around them and you can certainly see that the gentleman has a clear idea of how active he's going to be in these debates. Librarians individually identified librarians in public libraries and in school libraries have been identified, have been attacked, have had their information about where they live, their family situation and phone numbers provided to people who are angry with them have been threatened. And as we'll see in a moment, that has escalated from personal attacks and personal threats, calling long-term librarians groomers and pornographers calling them horrible things, and then threatening physical action against them. We have seen this emotional barrage now begin to move into the legal sector. And this is what I want to talk about. What I've talked to this point about is horrible. It is despicable. But it is not, at this point, systemically horrific. Let me introduce you to systemically horrific. Here's an article from the Washington Post. School librarians face a new penalty in the banned book wars, prison. Librarians could face years of imprisonment and tens of thousands of dollars in fines for providing sexually explicit, obscene, or harmful materials to books under a new state law that permits criminal prosecution of school and library personnel. And not to give away the ending here, because I know it's really easy to get fixated on, oh, that's schools and those are public libraries, but I'm a health science librarian. 
from in the university. In the US, I just have to mention things like trans care and sexual transition surgery, abortion, different medical rights and information and who has access to them, how you provide it. For example, there is, as we'll talk about in a moment, a law in Texas that says if you aid in an abortion, the person who got the abortion doesn't go to jail, but the people who aided and abetted provided information, provided connections, can be sued under a program where the people suing can get a bounty on that. In other words, if I find that you gave information to someone who used it to get an abortion, I can sue you and take money from you for doing that. Fun. At least seven states have passed such laws in the last two years. According to the Washington Post analysis, six of them in the past two months. Although governors in Ohio and North Dakota vetoed the legislation, another dozen states considered more than 20 similar bills this year, half of which are likely to come up again in 2024. One example, skipping to the end here, is an Arkansas measure that says school and public librarians, as well as teachers, can be imprisoned for up to six years or fine $10,000 if they distribute obscene or harmful texts. You're probably wondering, what is an obscene text? And the answer is, that's a good question, and it's changing every day. Let me show you what some of that legislation looks for and how this can be impacted. See, you're starting to feel the kitten thing, aren't you? Here are the, some of the text of three bills currently under um, debate and consideration by the Texas state legislature, so my home state. There is uh, HB, that's House Bill number 111, a bill to be enacted relating to the affirmative defenses to prosecution for certain offenses involving material or conduct that is obscene or otherwise harmful to children. What this law is about is if I sue you or arrest you for providing obscene materials to children, here are things you cannot claim as a defense, right? It used to be that if you were brought under prosecution or surveillance for providing material, it is an affirmative defense. It's okay to, you can say, I did it because. It's a affirmative defense to prosecution under this section that the sale, distribution, or exhibition was by a person having a bona fide judicial, law enforcement, or legislative agenda. That's the new language. What did they remove? A bona fide scientific, educational, governmental, or other similar justification. In other words, if I find that you handed what I consider an obscene text to a student or child of mine, I'm going to go and put you in jail. And when you show up and the judge asks, are you guilty? Unless you can say, I did it because the judge told me, a cop told me, or a congressman told me, you could go to jail. If you say, this was an educational material, it's part of learning, it's part of a class, part of a thesis, part of a document, part of a blah, 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 does it count? They took it out. They explicitly took it out. House Bill number 1,253, they're busy is relating to the punishment for the offense of sale, distribution, display, or harmful material to a minor, increasing a criminal penalty. So not only have they now taken away a defense saying, I did it as part of my educational responsibilities, my job, my teaching, my scientific responsibilities, they've now said that if you are found guilty, instead of this being a misdemeanor, this is now a felony. Now, U.S. law, I get it's weird, but take my word for it, a misdemeanor is jaywalking and crossing the road at the wrong time or putting bubble gum down on the sidewalk. A felony is murder. Now, there are different levels. This is not the highest level. This is not the murder level. But this is the one that sends you to jail and keeps you having a criminal record. These laws were put together, right? This is a clear attempt. And by the way, I'm only showing you two of those. So you go, oh, Dave. Well, that's horrible. How will I know what's obscene? Good news. House Bill number 338 tells you, sort of, it gives you a mechanism. Stick with me for a minute. So here's a bill that's related to content ratings for books and other written materials to be used in public schools. So once again, 
public schools. This is where we're teaching citizens how to be citizens. Math, reading, social studies, our history, everything. We want to make sure that when information goes into this learning environment, we're going to go ahead and force, wait for it, content ratings for books and other written materials. A publisher, so not even a librarian, before it ever shows up to your library, a publisher may not sell a book or written material to a school district or open your own charter school unless the publisher has assigned a content rating and has provided um, by this section the book and material and affixed to the cover of the book or material a label indicating the content rating un assigned under this. And then the rest of the law are things like, it's a book Y7, good for seven-year-olds, and it's a book G for a general audience, and a book PG-14. The state of Texas is proposing, and we're hoping will not pass, but is proposing and considering forcing book publishers to give things a, um, a grade, a level, a rating. And they talk about what's in the rating, such as rated content may contain intensely suggestive dialogue or situations, profanity or intense violence. Notice nowhere in here is the actual rubric to define what that stuff is. It's going to be at the interpretation of a judge. We can't bring things in unless they have been prejudged and told to us what this level is. I have worked with great school librarians. They talk about all the time that there are third graders who need to read at a sixth grade level or challenge themselves to read above the level. There are people in our libraries, in our school libraries, and yes, there are public library equivalents that need to come in and learn about their sexuality because they don't feel safe at home. Now they won't be able to. And librarians will be asked to enforce it. And there is a public library one. And so public librarians are supposed to, in essence, follow students, children around in their libraries to make sure they don't get the wrong rated book. This is where we're headed. And I don't mean in the future in a dystopian novel. I mean, these are currently being debated before the Texas state legislature. And this is only one of states that are doing it around the country. And it gets worse. This Dallas Observer piece report uh, Texas librarians could be sued for $10,000 under abhorrent proposed ordinances. What is that about? Well, what happens is, I'll just say it, a Texas anti-abortion legislation, Texas anti-abortion legislation lets private citizens sue, this was passed and adopted already, uh, sue those that believe they violated the state's ban on abortions. Axios company, reported on Thursday that the Austin attorney who helped design this historic law has drafted city ordinances that could potentially allow people to, quote, sue librarians and others for their decisions about which books to put on shelves or for expressing LGBTQ plus support. They are writing laws for very small localities, and the idea is that they'll then get adopted larger to sue librarians if they buy and shelve books about homosexuality. Similar to the abortion law, the book-related ordinance would apparently mean that violators could be sued for at least $10,000 plus attorney fees and legal expenses. The report also states that civil action could be brought against the library if workers don't scrub contested titles from shelves. And I have to give it to this, I have to give it to this journalist who ends with librarians certainly aren't happy with the idea, which is a way of minimizing something they're really pissed off about. Now, well, now it's okay. Deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. Because it's easy probably not to get too worked up about this because Americans are crazy. Americans are right wings and with our rifles and with eating our hamburgers and all the stereotypes you want, that's them. Yeah, but not always, right? We know that right wing governments are being uh, elected all the time. We know that people around different, it used to be about their extreme views of capitalism, but are increasingly about authoritarianism and where we provide. We're looking at how these ideas are being put in different places. Forget the fact that, yes, they're already in place in China and Russia and these different areas, but now we're seeing in our bastions of liberty, 
in the United States and elsewhere. And I can say it's already coming in the Netherlands and it's already coming in different places. We're seeing these challenges move. And this is a template that is being used first across the United States and then internationally to look at how we begin to control the narrative of how people and what people learn. Puppies, puppies, puppies. Take it in. So what's the response been? Well, there have been a couple of different responses. The first are what I consider social responses. This is organizations that have gotten together to try and change the narrative and challenge the narrative. When the loudspeakers show up at the uh, town council meeting and, and call for these books to be banned, they want to mobilize other parts of the community that will come and say, no, we don't ban these. We've done plenty of surveys have shown, for example, that the majority, the vast majority, regardless of political and ideological background, do not support book banning of any sort. 76%. There is a majority of people in these communities that do not want this to happen, but they don't know it's happening or they don't know what to do. And so you have things like the uh, Office for Intellectual Freedom from the American Library Association that provides data, provides materials, provides discussions, background, policy. In Texas, where I am and where I just showed you the legislation, the Texas Library Association has launched the Texans for the Right to Read, where they're also providing a social media campaign with hashtags. They're trying to organize people to demonstrate that the majority of people are against this. And I really want to point out um, in the U.S., the um, Every Library organization, which is about advocacy for public libraries, has done an incredible job from petitioning to creating legal briefs to creating different materials and a campaign around it. So there's been an attempt to answer this. When it started happening two years ago, librarians were caught unaware. We were used to being the radical positive change agents that everyone either ignored or loved. Or if they ignored us, they still kind of loved us, right? It was kind of hard to think badly. And in that time, when suddenly they were being called groomers, they were being called pornographers, they were being called out by name, they were being threatened, we didn't know what to do. We weren't, as librarians, used to being under the microscope and in an intensely negative way. And it's taken us a year to begin to mobilize these responses, but it's what ha what's happening. In addition to these sort of social narrative, there are legal responses. In Llano County, Texas, a public library withdrew materials. Um, I'm part of the court case there, so I can't speak too much about it, but all public records. Um, but seven citizens sued the county and the librarians and the library for the removal of these materials under our First Amendment freedom of speech rights. And that's progressing through the court system. In uh, Metro Atlanta, over in Georgia, the United States Department of Education has had a civil rights finding that when they removed black and queer books from the collection, they did it in a way that intimidated and caused negative effects to minority students. So they're legal responses. There are also responses about understanding these arguments and understanding what we should do about these arguments. So when you look at the arguments, when you look at the discussions, and I want to be really clear, this is an important thing to do. It is extraordinarily easy to demonize people on the other side of this equation. It is very easy, and you can see that I'm very on the edge of doing it on a regular basis in this talk, to create this sort of single generic view of these people are out to ban materials. These are bad people. But it's important that we don't do that because then we can't have a constructive conversation. And as I said before, there are things that we agree on. So the out loud part, that's the things that people say, is they'll talk about parents' rights, that there is a right as a parent that I should control what my children are exposed to, how often with being brought together. I'm not comfortable with them having this conversation about gender. I'm not comfortable with my child who's 5, 10, 15, whatever it is, having discussions about homosexuality, etc. There's a truth to that. We can understand that. It's, once again, when it goes beyond to, and therefore no other children should be able to be exposed to this as well. But let's just take for a moment that parents do have rights in how their children are raised. And parents, as citizens, have a right to talk about how libraries are formed and structured. And by the way, if you think I'm just talking about parents of K-12, to you haven't been in higher education that often because as someone who does, was a library 
a director of a library science program, I got regular calls from parents talking about what their children had access to. One of the other thing in the United States is talking about religious liberty. That is teaching people in something that is contrary, contrary to what my religious beliefs are and identity. Once again, that makes sense, depends on how far it gets applied. And if your religious liberty can somehow infringe on my religious liberty, then we have issues. Issues of curriculum. Bringing in materials that isn't based on what they're learning in the classroom, that may be enrichment, but it also is the idea of taking someone beyond what we are proposing as a community that they learn. And this is one that often you hear about. We're not banning books. We're not seeking to ban books. We don't want to ban a book. We just want to prevent our children from having access to the book. And when we do that, your children won't have it either. But that's not banning. It is, right? But they can still buy it on Amazon if they have money. They can still do it through interlibrary loan if your library has money. They can still get it online, maybe. Right? So the other one is grooming and indoctrination, that somehow we're making what these folks feel, and primarily from a religious moral perspective, is an unhealthy or unsavory or sinful lifestyle. We are normalizing it, which is not wrong because as a society, we are normalizing it. But pushing back, that is seen as grooming or indoctrination. That you are sending them to university and they're coming out more liberal than when we send them, that clearly you are liberal and making them so, as opposed to education tends to do that to people. Right? So these are the things that said out loud. What the quiet part is, and the really worrisome, and I want to be clear also that not everyone saying the out loud part agrees with the quiet part, but there are enough that it's concerning, is the quiet part is about racism that having a lot of black protagonists telling their life story is problematic, or that you're really talking about people who are not like me suddenly being seen as legitimate, which takes power away from me. We're seeing a strong anti-LGBTQ area. As the United States has moved forward in granting more rights, including marriage, crazy, we've seen a black backlash against this as an aberrant lifestyle and trying to pull those back and at the very least not exposing my children to it or letting my children think it's okay because in my religious moral tradition it's not. But what's really interesting, the thing I want to pull your attention to, is that we're talking ultimately about disconnect, social disconnection. I don't feel I have power in this group and I should or who should have power in this community and a limiting of a democratic voice. The people who should have a say in our education, in our libraries, in our medicine, in our health, in these different decisions should be only these groups that have it. Right? We've seen that with abortion laws in the U.S. and around the world. We're seeing it now in what we teach and how we educate. Underneath all of this, it comes down to trust. And this is where I move from a U.S. perspective to the international perspective. Because what we're talking about is we have seen in the U.S. the trust in librarianship and librarians in particular be destroyed. I don't want to destroy, it's diminished, challenged. In the U.S. and frankly globally, we've seen institutional legitimacy be challenged, right? The presidency, the prime ministership, the Congress, the this, that no longer holds weight. What do they do? What do they say? Because we're losing trust. And what we're seeing is that that loss of trust in institutions is being directed around librarians. And once again, for things like to gain power, et cetera. Now, challenges can actually build trust. If a community and a community member finds a piece of material or a service or something within a library's operation that they find problematic, they should be able to challenge it. That's what trust is. People have a voice and a say and a vote, and that's important but only if that voice, that challenge, goes into a clear, consistent, inclusive, and transparent process. Not taking the books out in the middle of the night and calling it weeding, but if they, someone challenges a book and says, okay, this is how you challenge a book. First, you read it. Secondly, you get a group of people that are inclusive of a community, not just friends and buddies and like-minded, and you all read it. And then you look at it and you do, judge it against these criteria and the outcome of that, we're keeping it, we're getting rid of it, is transparent and obvious to all. Without those components, simply becomes a matter of the librarian's pick 
or the power behind the librarian's pick or a vocal minority pick. We must have these clear and consistent challenges because what we're doing is we're building a civic conversation where people come in to have a conversation around this area. The efforts that we're seeing with this trust are to diminish and dismiss the expertise of librarians. What we're seeing is we're taking on the notion of expertise. Those professors with bow ties, those librarians with their degrees, those experts and doctors and what have you, what we're seeing is people challenging that very idea of expertise. Some of it is to create political action, to gain power. If I get you mad at the librarian, vote for me and I'll get the librarian. It's the othering that we see in political discourse all the time. But we're also seeing this effort into changing social norms and the definition of merit. What that means, and this is where I want to be really clear that this is sort of a U.S. thing, but please don't screw it up, <laughs> is that what we're seeing is who belongs and who is seen as an expert and that people are left out of that expert, gain, become disenfranchised, they get angry, and they seek power to change the setting. This is a great book, one of my favorites ever, After the Ivory Tower Falls, and it talks about in the U.S., where the U.S. after World War II, college education, well, before World War II, college education was seen as an elitist activity. It was elite, it was a few people, they could afford it, it was really the upper crust who went to it. After World War II, for lots of different reasons, it became a public good. And public money from the government, from the state, from the national government, more or less provided free higher education to anyone who wanted it. And it really did change what the middle class was. It changed participation. It also changed because it was around liberal education, liberal democracies. And the goal after that was when people were returning from World War II, we wanted our citizens to know about liberal democracy so they wouldn't fall into fascism. And then in the 1960s, when all these students realized that the government that was paying for their college education was also interfering in, you know, South Asian nations and oil countries and CIA activities, they created the counter-revolution, the, count, the, the counter-culture. And then we saw states begin to say, well, education is really about uh, preparing for a job. And why should I pay for your tuition when you're going to get a good job? Why don't you pay for your tuition? Because that's your benefit. And they began seeing that um, public money for education began falling farther and farther down. And the cost of education directly to the students went higher and higher above the rate of inflation, to which the point college became inaccessible to a large part based on your socioeconomic status. Were you poor? Were you born in a certain zip code? Did you have a certain minority status? But the problem with that, which is many problems, but one of the problems with that is that the idea that college was still about merit, that is, you got into college based on your brain, you succeeded in education based on how meritorious you were, remained. So even though people couldn't go to college because they couldn't afford it, they were often identified as people who couldn't hack it, couldn't do it, weren't meritorious enough. And that created political division to the point now, when you look at people with strong right-wing values, the variable that is best in determining whether they belong to that group is their level of educational attainment, right? What we've done is disconnected a whole generation and they're now seeking power and they want to dismiss that meritorious process because the game's rigged against them. By the way, there's an irony that they don't see that the game has been rigged against a lot of people that they're trying to ban books about, but stick with me. Now, I tell you this, and this is I'm going to end up here, because this building of trust, this creation of connection, this radical service, where we still very much need to be radicalized, comes into health information. And I'm going to do that by telling you a very personal story. This is me. This is me getting an, a long-term EEG study. Um, the one in the middle I love because it's the only time in my life I've ever had a ponytail. And the one over on the far right is me with uh, my pole um, with uh, decorations and chemotherapy. Yay. Uh, this is how I learned I had cancer. I was in the Upstate Medical uh, Hospital. It was a Friday. It was approximately three o'clock in the afternoon. I had been checked in because I had a platelet count of four. And for those of you who don't keep up with that, that means that I could bleed out at any time and die. Yay. They were trying to figure it out. 
sitting in my room, three o'clock Friday with my wife, a medical intern came in, said, we believe that you have uh, lymphoma. We think we found um, an area that we have to biopsy and we have to do it within the next 10 minutes or else we'll miss the lab. She kicked my wife out, had me laying flat on a bed where a doctor was then walking her through her first ever uh, bone marrow biopsy into my pelvic bone. The nurse grabbed my hand and started talking to me. Where's your favorite place to go? Where do you love to travel? What's happening? Doing her best, God bless her, to distract from what was happening on my back. The minute the intern pulled the core out, she dropped my hand went out of the room, found my wife in the waiting room, sat down and said, you're planning his funeral, stop it. There is a whole process we go through. Now, just for fun, that eventually led to chemo, that eventually failed, that eventually led to a bone marrow transplant, that eventually failed. I got a different kind of cancer, yay me. That led to a bone marrow transplant from my son, and here I am five years after that transplant, feeling great. So good news there. Go back to three o'clock on Friday. If I were three stories up and about 40 years younger, I would have been in the children's hospital. This is how they deliver uh, prognoses. A doctor meets with the nurse and a li medical librarian to go over what's about to happen, the diagnosis, what's going on. The doctor and nurse go into the room. They talk to the parents and the child, go through what's happening. The doctor leaves, the nurse stays and talks about care, talks about progress of care, how it's going to happen. When the nurse is done, the librarian goes in. The librarian sits with the parents with an iPad and the iPad is connected to a network that's not the library so it won't be slanted in its results. Does a search on all the keywords, lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, whatever, and then goes with the parents and says, this first one, that's an ad. The second one's gonna tell you crystals can cure it. They can't. This is a great document, et cetera because she knows the first thing any of us are gonna do when we get that is we're gonna search and say, what's happening to me, what's gonna happen? She provides information therapy. That humane way of connecting to our communities builds trust. When you look at trust within the US and you look at professions, the number one most trusted profession in the United States are nurses, not doctors, nurses, because they're there holding your hand when they're putting the core in your back. Then yes, doctors. By the way, librarians. At the very bottom, it is used car salesmen, then congressmen. It's fun. The local connection, that trust that we build is essential because it means that when that vocal minority knocks on our door and says, we want these books removed, we want this stuff out of here, you can turn to your trusted colleagues, your friends, the network you've built and have them show up and say, that's not gonna happen. Or this is the clear, consistent, transparent and inclusive process we're going to go through. Or this is not about censorship. This is not about what have you. This is the importance of education. This is real change. At the end of the day, this quote, to be a librarian is not to be neutral or passive or waiting in question, is to be a radical positive change agent within your community is still true and you still need to do it. But it's different now because when you do this, when you go out into your communities, if you're in the U.S., and I hope not soon, but I have a feeling soon, you're going to walk out and people are going to call you radical. And they're not going to mean the cool kind. They're going to talk about you being liberal and a radical and out of tune and trying to indoctrinate and groom people. And you need to have a community that can stand up and say, and has your back that says, nope, this is what we do. This is their expertise. This is how we do this. This is how we provide this service. So we need a follow-up quote. So the follow-up quote is to be a radical positive change agent, is to fight for your whole community, your values against censorship, against curbing intellectual freedom, about creating safe places to explore dangerous ideas, and for democracy itself. And some people shy away from that. And they go, democracy, too big word, doesn't matter, that's too abstract, etc. But that's literally what we're talking about. The people who wrote those bills in the Texas legislatures went through our schools and our public libraries. And if we didn't tell them about the value of democratic participation and how all people should be valued and all those views, then we failed. 
If we don't talk about democracy in our medical systems, in our healthcare systems, in our libraries, and if we don't care about in our medical libraries what happens in those public libraries and those school libraries, shame on us. I have a picture. I am living through a picture right now of what happens if we abdicate the field to others. If we abdicate the narrative of the power of librarianship and what it means to be a radical positive change agent, and we let other people try and define that, then we not only lose, but the communities and societies that we are a part of loses. I invite you to be a radical positive change agent. I invite you to fight the fight. I invite you to be happy and never have to deal with this. And I pray you never have to deal with this. But if you don't think about it, and you don't prepare for it, and you don't proactively seek to avoid this situation in your local setting, it can happen. We've been here before, and the good news is we've gotten better because of it, but the bad news is it didn't get better on its own. It takes committed professionals to make life better. If you want to talk and you want to claim the title of radical positive change agent, then now is the time to do it. And it's scary and it can be dangerous, but ultimately it's what makes the world a better place. And that's ultimately why we have librarians. Thank you very much.